Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Last week, we talked about, uh, with respect of growth, we talked about the Apostle Matthew. And uh, in doing so, I, I kind of, um, I mentioned Peter. I brought him into this whole thing. And, uh, and this morning, I kind of want to clear his name. You know, Thomas, he was, a, uh, he was a doubter. Peter, he was a denier. But he also had some, some good things about him. He also did some good things. So this morning, I really want to focus on him. First of all, let me say this, that Peter messed up big time. <laughs> he messed up big time. He had uh, kind of his, uh, his past was really his present when he denied the Lord. Now, when we look at people like Matthew... We would say, well, Matthew's past as a tax collector and a friend with publicans and sinners, that was his past, I mean, before he came to know the Lord. But Peter, Peter knew the Lord. At that time, Peter, Peter knew God. And so isn't it always easier to put the, the distant past behind you, the Let's call it the, the pre-conversion past, the, uh, the B.C. days, the before Christ days. It's easier to put that stuff kind of behind you, isn't it? But when we get to Peter, we say, now, you knew better, Peter. Shame on you. Because you knew what to do. And he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. And you knew you were in the wrong. That's why he knew what he did, and he wept bitterly. And so when we look at Peter, we have to come up with some good things because he had some good things. So let's look at that this morning, and uh, we'll begin in the Gospel of John. I was going to review a little bit about Matthew, but uh, for the sake of time, let's just dive right in. Let's look, first of all, that Peter trusted God for salvation. Peter trusted God for salvation, and I'm so thankful that Peter knew the Lord. I'm thankful that Peter knew the Lord, and hopefully you're here this morning and you know the Lord. Hopefully you know the Lord more than just know about him, but you know him on a very personal, intimate level, because there is a difference. To this point in, uh, in John uh, chapter 1, we get to verse 40, but uh, leading up to that, we have John the Baptist. And he, uh, he, if you're there in John chapter 1, I'll read a couple verses. If you look at uh, beginning in verse uh, 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Very profound statement. One of the most profound statements found in Scripture is this statement right here made by John the Baptist. And John was over here. He was baptizing by the Jordan. Many of you have been by the Jordan. I don't know how many of you have been in the Jordan being baptized. I baptized several people last time we were there, but we know the, the geographical location of the Jordan River. And there John was. He was baptizing. And here comes this individual, and uh, sure enough, it's Jesus. And he looks over, and he declares that Jesus, this person, is the Lamb of God. And the Lamb of God is important because the Lamb of God or a lamb, was used to cover the sins of the people. It was used to cover the sins of the people, but not to take away the sin of the people. So here John is saying that this Jesus, this person, is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Very powerful. He gets down to verse 36, and he repeats it again. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. So John the Baptist had a, had a bunch of people that followed him. Two of these people in verse 40, and it says, One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So here Andrew is. He's amongst the disciples of John the Baptist, or at least overhearing what he is saying about the Messiah. And, uh, and then you have his... Uh, uh, he takes, here's Andrew, rather, he takes uh, Simon Peter in verse 41. He findeth, he first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah. So he gets to the point where uh, he is introduced now Simon Peter, Peter to the Messiah. And I'm thankful that Peter 
got to know who the Lord was. Now, I'm not sure that this is the point of his salvation. We'll look at that in a second. But can I say this, that this was the beginning point for Peter, where he got to know who the Lord was. And aren't you glad that someone introduced you to the Lord? Aren't you glad that somebody took you alongside and said, Joel, let me, let me tell you about the Messiah? Or Howard, let me tell you about the Messiah. Now, Peter may ended up a denier, and he did deny, but you know what? He didn't start a denier. Nobody has a perfect faith. I want to be an encouragement to you here this morning. If you don't have a perfect faith, you're in good company. I don't know how many of you waver in your faith a little bit from time to time, and you have your ups and you have your downs, and Peter had his ups and he had his downs. And right here in John chapter 1, verse 40 and 41, he had an up, didn't he? He came to know the Messiah, and he goes on, and it says in uh, verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Can you imagine for just a moment if you were in this time period and, uh, and your brother is so excited about the Messiah that he brings you over to meet him. Now, last week we talked about Matthew and how he got together and he brought all the publicans and sinners together, had a feast in his house, invited Jesus over, and, uh, and there he ate with publicans and sinners. Can I ask you this morning, has somebody done that for you or have you done that for somebody? And a better question is, have you done that for a relative? And when I, when, I look at, when I look at Andrew and the excitement that he had for the Messiah, just saying, hey, Peter, come meet this guy. Meet this guy. His name is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. His name is Christ. Have you done that for somebody in your family? Have you brought the plan of salvation to those people who are closest to you? It's one thing to bring them to your friends. You know, we know that a prophet is without honor his own home. One of the hardest things, one of the hardest people to bring the Messiah to is your family. How many of you at some point in time have shared Christ with a family member? How many of you at some point have shared Christ with somebody in your family with great rejection? It happens. It's very, very difficult. But Andrew thought this is the good thing, so he brings, he brings uh, uh, Peter and, and Jesus together, and they meet, and and uh, what an exciting time in a family. You know, we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ, those people who are saved, but how much neater is it to know that your family members have trusted Christ as their Savior? That they have had a personal encounter meeting the Lord. We all have ups and downs, and this was certainly an up for Peter. This was certainly an up for Peter. This is one of the greatest days Peter ever had, was the day he met the Messiah. But I think the greatest day that Peter ever had was the day he got saved. Because, see, you can meet the Messiah. You can know who Jesus is without actually being saved. I mean, listen, the devils also believe. I mean, you can know who Jesus is and not trust him as your Savior. I can, I can know that someone can save my soul. I can know that someone can, can help me out. If, if Brooks is a phenomenal swimmer, and, and there I am in the, in the Mississippi River, drowning, getting water in my mouth, and if I get water in my mouth in the Mississippi, just let me drown. <laughs> I'm not sure it's worth living after that. But there I am, drowned. I can know that he is, a, he is a, a, a really good swimmer and still not trust him to save me, not, not allow him to save me. So people can know who Jesus is, know that he has the power to be able to save them and still reject, just like the devil. The greatest day that Peter ever had was the day that Peter got saved. And I don't know what day that is. I do know the day of his confession in Matthew 16, verse 14 to 16, 
And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, Jesus said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? This is his confession. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a powerful statement. This is probably another one of the most powerful statements in Scripture. Can I ask you a question this morning? Who do you say that Jesus is? Do you chalk him up to be a prophet? Do you chalk him up to just being a good person? Do you say, well, he, he is the Savior of the world except for me? Or do you say, no, he is the Savior. He is my Savior. And I have trusted him. Do you trust him the way that we know Peter did when he got saved? Nobody has a perfect faith. But Peter had a pretty good start, didn't he? How many of y'all waver in your faith from time to time? How many of y'all have your ups and your downs? Now, sometimes we, we read our Bible more than, uh, more than other times. Sometimes we pray more at times than other times. Sometimes we're, we give at times more than other times. Sometimes we come to church more at times than other times. You ever feel like you're on a spiritual roller coaster? You ever feel like that? I, I feel like that. I'm the pastor, you know? I feel like I'm on a spiritual roller coaster where I've got my ups and I've got my downs. Where I've got my good days and I have my bad days. That's right. And can I tell you something, friends? You are in good company. Not that we should be excited about our bad days. We should have faith that is unwavering. And we even see this in James 1, 5 to 7. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth liberally and abradeth not. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. Very powerful. Not wavering. For he that wavereth is like the waves of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. Verse 7, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. You know, I tell you, when, I'm, when I am unwavering in my faith is when I see God work in my life more than anything else. But I have my good days, and I have my bad days. Now, we strive for good days. We strive to continue to have an unwavering faith. But Peter's faith wavered. But aren't you glad that Peter trusted God for salvation? Can I say this secondly, that Peter trusted God for safety? That Peter trusted God for safety. This is when you need the Lord the most when it comes to your temporal needs. This is when many people call on God. When we are in trouble for safety, when we, when we need some level of protection, Matthew Chapter 14, Matthew 14, 22 through 30, tell this great story. It says this, beginning in verse 22, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go over before him on the other side while he sent the multitude away. Now, many of you who have been with me to Israel can remember where the uh, Sea of Galilee is, the Sea of Gennesaret. It was... It was uh, a vast body of water in the northeastern region of Israel. And, and uh, when we were there several years ago, uh, you know, people, could, people told me all the time that storms just brew up really quick. They just, they just, they just show up out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it myself. And we were down by the boat, ready to get on the boat to go on the Sea of Galilee. And, and uh, the, the guy looks up at the sky and he says, his name is David, he looks up at the sky and says, it's, you guys got to take cover. Okay. <laughs> it's like, we're from, we're from Iowa, okay? We have tornadoes and things like that. I'm not worried about a little, little sky up here. And so uh, who, who was with me on that trip? Who was with me? Okay. So several of you, yeah. So, so there we are. We, we, all right, well, fine. So you listen to your guide and so you get out. We, I don't know. Was anybody, I don't even know if anybody was on the boat yet, but we climbed back up this little hill and, and we took cover and bang! <laughs> Rain just came pouring down, freaked me out. There was, 
I mean, blew up, I think, a tree or something next to me. It must have sounded like a firework. I mean, it was huge. It was huge. And, uh, and then uh, we waited for about five minutes, and it just gone. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it myself. So there's this storm that's going to brew on this very lake, this very sea. Verse 23, Matthew 14, 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. So here the multitudes went away, and he's got his disciples there on a boat. He goes up into this mountain. And so he was there alone, verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried for fear. Verse 27 But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, this is Peter and his, Peter was kind of obnoxious. And so, I I mean, you you can imagine, like, the Lord can do anything. And so here it is, this is Peter's plea. And and, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water, right? Like, Lord, if you say that it's actually you, then perform some miracle so I can say that this is you, right? I mean, we do this in our own lives. Lord, if this really is your will, if this is who you say, I mean, okay, I'm, I think I'm hearing God. Work a miracle for me so I can, add, there's some validity here, you know? And so we do this. We're just like Peter. And he said, because this is what God does, he said, come. I will prove it to you. Verse 29, he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. Powerful. Here Jesus was walking on the water. Or Peter was. Well, Jesus was too, but Peter was walking on the water. But when he saw, verse 30, when he saw the wind was boisterous, wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. You can't take any word out of there and have it mean the same thing. Lord, save me. You know, there is only one person that can do the work that the Lord can do, and that's the Lord. And so many of us as as Christians, so many of us as Christians are trying to trust something else for safety, right? Now, Now, Peter trusted God for safety. He is the one who said, Lord, save me. But us as Christians, we trust all manner of things to to try to keep us safe. One of the last things we we go to, one of the last people we we go to is God. You know, in this current uh, COVID environment, we trust all manner of things. And and I have this as an example of where we put our trust. I'm not saying that a mask at times isn't appropriate. I'm not saying that. But there are a lot of people who put a lot of stock in a mask. I was at Dunkin' Donuts the other day. This lady, she had this mask on. Put this thing on. This is the fourth time I've worn a mask. Can you imagine me preaching in one of these? Actually, you don't have to imagine because you're seeing me preaching in one of these. So I'm at Dunkin', and uh, am I smiling right now? You can't tell. Can you tell if I'm sticking out my tongue at you? <laughs> okay, you can. She's, she gets me a donut because the donut was free. I just want to, I got a coffee. And she, I said, what's the best value? Because I'm a pastor. So, of course, I say, what's the best value? And she says, of course. So it's the large. I said, okay, well, I'll take a large. She says, that comes with a free donut. What would you like? Brother, do you think I was going to say no? <laughs> so, so here she is. She, I come to the window. And she's got her gloves on, and she's very, very sweet, very polite. And she says, can I help? How, what, um, okay, so you want, you want, you want your coffee. Okay, good. Just creamer, is that right? And she's, she's doing this. You realize that that is right up against her mouth, right? And so there she is. She's, then she, she takes the, uh, my, my card. Sometimes they take the card, and they, uh, they actually just put the machine out the window, and you put your card in the chip that never works. Just saying. Until you, you try it three times and you have to swipe it anyway. It's like, why don't we just swipe it the first time? 
whatever. So she, she takes my card, which was in my pocket, in my hand, and then she continues to put the drink together and gets my donut. I, I can't imagine preaching in this for very long. And she kept tugging at her face mask. Do, do you guys, and then, you know, they do this. It's like, dude, that's right next to your ear, you know? It's right next to your ear, and it's right next to uh, your mouth, and, and, yet, and yet they do that, and they tug at it. And this is where people put their safety. This, this here is what people, people are putting their trust in. People are putting their trust there. You know what they're also trusting? They're trusting being socially distant. They're saying, well, as long as I stay away from people, they're trusting isolation. They're trusting the government. And God knows we're just trusting the government to come up with a vaccine because as soon as they have a vaccine, everything is back to normal, right? And you know what God is saying? He's saying that I wish people would just trust me. Just like Peter who said, Lord, save me. He didn't say the government save me. He didn't say the mask save me. Lord, save me. And we put our trust in, in all manner of things except for the one thing that we know that can really bring us safety. You, you know what, what, what interests me, I think, is verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous. When he saw the, the circumstances around him. You know, that's when he began to fear. He was not fearful when he had his eyes on the Lord. He takes his eyes off God. He, God, he notices everything around him. He notices CNN and NBC and ABC and all of these other things. And I, I'm just telling you, I think we watch a little too much news. I think, I think we're, we're so concerned with everything else going on around us, we are not fixed on the one who can save us, which is God. And when we, when we look around at all of the circumstances and the world is coming down and the, the virus is getting, it, it's, it's growing in every area and, 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 uh, and, and what about the economy and what about my family and what about the school and what about all this stuff? And you know what? We forget to say, Lord, save me. He's the only one that can really help us. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord throughout all of our circumstances. And there are those who use religion as a crutch. Can I say that too? You know what? Praise God. Praise God for those people who lean on the Lord in tough times. That, that, that's not a consolation prize for our Savior. That is what he wants from us, to lean on him. And when you trust in the Lord for safety, you will be safe. Psalm 125.1, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. You trust in the Lord? Watch this. You shall be like Mount Zion. You should be like a mountain, which cannot be moved, but, but will abide forever. I'm glad that Peter trusted God for salvation, and I'm glad that Peter trusted God for safety. Let me say this as well. Peter trusted God for his sustenance. For his sustenance. It's another word for provision, but it started with a P, and the other one started with an S, and I couldn't do that. It had to alliterate. Peter trusted God for sustenance. People trust God for salvation. They trust him for safety, but, but why not believe that God can provide for you? Peter trusted God for this. John 21, verses 1 to 7, and these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, or after these things, rather. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee in verse 2, and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. So seven out of the guys were there on this boat. And if you've seen the boat at the Jesus Museum... It's pretty, can you imagine fitting seven guys on there? Pretty small boat, right? And Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. Now, people love that, <laughs> especially fishermen. 
They say even Peter went fishing. I'm not sure I like this. And here's why. Because God called him away from that. God called him away from that occupation and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the first chance that Peter gets, he goes back to doing what God called him from. That bothers me a little bit. I don't mind fishing. I take it back. I don't like to go fishing. I like to catch fish. And there is a big difference, right, Max? Right, Joe? Right, Phil? Big difference between going fishing and catching fish. I hate fishing. I have other things to do with my time. Now, you put a three, four-pound bass on there, I like catching fish. So here he is, he goes fishing. They say unto him, this is the disciples. Hey, we'll also go with thee. <laughs> now, those are fishing buddies. They said nothing about catching fish. We're just going to go fishing. His buddies say, oh, well, we'll go with thee in verse 3. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Now, that sounds like a typical fishing trip right there, you know? He didn't say they were going to go catch fish. He said, we're going to go fishing, which means you're going to catch nothing. But when the morning was now come, they stayed out all night. They were out there too late. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew that knew not that it was Jesus. So here he is, Jesus, on the shore. They're on the Sea of uh, uh, Tiberias, right, which is Gennesaret, which is Galilee, all the same thing. And they see this individual standing over on the shoreline, not knowing that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? But that's a typical one fisherman to another. Did, have you caught anything? How many times have you said that out on a boat? You know, on a boat. Let's say that like a Minnesotan. How many times have you said that out on a boat? You're out there fishing on the boat, and someone hollers to you and say, Hey, have you caught anything? And they answered him, a typical fisherman, No! <laughs> I caught one small one. <laughs> it's just so funny. I could just... Put myself here in their shoes. And he said unto them, Then cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Hey, have you caught anything? No! Come over here, the fish is over there. They're just getting away from the fish. That's typical fisherman talk. They cast their four. Verse 6, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Now, that is not normal. This stranger, who they knew not who it was, was on the shore. They had fished all night. He's just simply, I think that they had probably cast the net on the other side at least once or twice all night long. It was at Jesus' command, they followed. And they couldn't draw up the net for the multitude of fishers. That's amazing. Verse 7, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, can you imagine? He, it's the Lord. With excitement. It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. Let's not go there. And did cast himself into the sea. Now that's interesting. Once again, you know, Peter is impulsive. I mean, he could have just said, like, yo, Peter, just chill. We're going to get there. He couldn't, he couldn't hold, he couldn't contain. He's just like, dude, I'm in the water right now. It's amazing God always provides. You know, we will trust him for salvation, trust him for safety, but not for sustenance. God always provides, even if you're not sure that it's him providing what a neat lesson that is. Now, if you, if Peter, if, the, if the, everybody on the boat would have known that that was the Lord, I'm not sure that they would have waited to cast it in. I think they would have just jumped in or rode back or whatever and to meet the Lord. But you know what? Even when you're not sure God's providing, God's providing. I think we need to work as hard as we can. But many forget to account for the supernatural act of God. It's amazing. It's supernatural. Supernatural. It's not natural. It's not normal. You don't just catch no fish all night, and then all of a sudden you cast your net over here, and then you catch 
a multitude of fish. We need to leave a gap for God in our lives, don't we? We need to leave a gap for God in our lives where we can trust him for sustenance. Trust him to provide for us. Trust him to provide. Matthew 6, 31 to 33, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewith, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God will provide your needs. God will provide your needs. He will provide all of your sustenance, all of your safety, and all of the salvation that you'll ever need. Peter had some ups and downs in his life, but I tell you what, I think he, I think he ended on the upside. We have our upsides and we have our downsides where we say, Lord, I'm a wretched man. And I need your help today to save me from my circumstances. It's not going to be the mask. I'm not saying that it doesn't have virtue. I'm not saying that. I don't want to offend anybody. I think that people maybe should be wearing masks at times. But that's not going to save your soul. That's not going to save your soul. I'm not, I'm not waiting for Merck or Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson or one of these other big behemoth companies to come out with a vaccine. I'm going to trust God. We were talking earlier this week, and we said the reality is, is in the midst of the coronavirus, how many millions, well, how many thousands and thousands and thousands of babies have been, have been aborted? How many people have died of heart disease? How many people have died of car accidents? None of that stuff is on the report. It would be neat if, if the governor would put that in a report. Wouldn't it be neat if, if top to bottom they said, this is how many people died of all these different things? I think what this is doing is it may be the coronavirus, COVID, might be revealing to us a deficiency in our ability to trust God. There's a lot of areas we, we need to grow in our life. Are you trusting God to help you grow through this? Are you trusting God to help you see that maybe I need to trust God in this? And friends, I, I say this politely. We, sometimes we just got to turn off Facebook and, and the news because that is causing us to lose our focus. That's the boisterous wind out there. That's the noise of the economy, the noise of everything around us. And it's distracting us. And you know what? That's when we lack our faith. Because we see all of these things. We trust God for our safety. And we can trust God for our sustenance. And I think most importantly, we can trust God for our salvation. There may be somebody in this room right now or somebody listening online that doesn't know where they're going when they die. Boy, I would want to know. I would want to know where I'm going when I die. This morning I had these, you ever have like heart palpitations? And of course the first thing you think, I already had one heart attack, I don't really want another one. And, uh, you know, so it's like the first thing I think of is like, okay, okay, am I right with everybody? <laughs> just make sure I just don't die, right? I mean, it could happen to you, you could drop dead, and, and do you know where you're going when you die? Are you 100% certain that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. The Bible also said that we, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There is none righteous, no, not one. I mean, there are multitudes of verses that say that we are all sinners and come short of God's perfect standard. Perfection. We all have the sin. God loves us but hates our sin. To go to heaven, you can't have this sin. The sin has to be paid for. You have to have this sin paid for. If you die, 
if you die with this sin, you can't go to heaven because heaven's a perfect place. You have to have this sin paid for. Now watch this. This is really neat. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not church membership or going to, you know, getting baptized or giving money or being here or wearing a mask. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. Someone has to die. If you die paying for the sin, you don't go to heaven. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth, and watch this, he died on the cross. The Lamb of God that doesn't cover but takes away the sin of the world. It's not about him just covering the sin. It's about him who came to this earth And I want this hand, and I mean it reverently, to represent the Lord Jesus. He took our sin away. He paid for it. Because the wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. Well, I I try to live a good life. Good, but living a good life isn't the payment for sin. Death is. Well, I, uh, I go to church. Well, going to church is good, but going to church isn't the payment for sin. Death is. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sin. And then he looks at you and me as without sin. You see, he died, was buried, and rose again from the grave three days later to prove that his payment on the cross was sufficient for, for you. I didn't have a, now, that is supernatural, that one should die for the sin of the world. For by one man, sin entered into the world. That was Adam. And because we are all an offspring of Adam, we all have sin. Then the second Adam, which is Jesus, he comes to this earth to die on the cross, to pay for our sin, is buried, comes back. He has to come back. If if God died and was buried and didn't come back from the grave, he ain't God. I wouldn't trust in a God that that couldn't come back from the grave. If the Bible says he can do all things and he can't come back from the grave, that's not much of a God. I'm so thankful that he came back from the grave. It proved to... Everyone, that this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. Now, if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior and you don't know where you're going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beg you today that you would place your faith in Him alone as your Savior. It's not about coming forward. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I, I'm not going to ask you to, to stand up and shout your name. I'm not going to ask you to baptize. I want you, in the quietness of your own mind, to trust Jesus as your Savior. The Bible says, for by grace, watch this, are you saved through faith. Faith. For by grace you are saved through faith. And not of yourselves. So it's nothing you can do. It's what Jesus has already done for you. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There'll be no braggers in heaven. There'll be no boasters, nobody that says, hey, I got, to, I got to heaven because I was a good person, or I gave money to the church, or I walked an aisle, or I prayed a prayer. It's because you have trusted Jesus as your Savior. It's not about work you did. It's about work he did for you. I want to beg you that you'd place your faith in him alone as your Savior.